unmute. Good afternoon. Sorry, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. Let the bells ring in the palace. Um, okay, host. Uh, so, so you're going to need to give me screen. Yeah. Um, and, and then I need to set my second screen rather than my primary screen. So um, if I think you just have to request to share your screen and I just approve you. Uh, I'm just getting a, a message that says host disabled participant screen sharing. So you need to actually enable. I'll go to that right screen now. Sharing. Zoom. I always, that's why I always like to join these things a little early. No, I agree. Okay. Get all of this Meetings. stuff out of the way. All right, let's have a thing for me to do. Host, participant. Oh, well, let me edit because we started the meeting. Hold on. Advanced sharing options. All participants. Okay, work. See if it'll let you do it now. All right, just hang on. Let me just go share screen. There we go. Screen two. Share. Perfect. And um, let's get rid of. Oh no, cancel. I don't want to do that. I want to minimize that. Um, let's move this over here. Let's actually get um, from the beginning, start the slideshow. So are you seeing the screen? I sure am. When a log house leaks, the log builder gets blamed. Yep. It's all our fault. Um, so my, my focus is primarily on log houses and gasketing but i'm you know i'm also touching on on uh just other other ceiling and in post and beam post and beam timber frame um as well but i got a zoom through it there's it, it, there's 29 slides but actually within some of the slides there are four or five images that pop up so there's quite a bit of stuff i didn't really know how much time we had I, so i just went ahead and how much, how much, how long is this going to be? So we have up to two hours. Oh but, my God. Oh, but, okay. but no, I know it's not going to be that long. So I advertised it as an hour and a half, um, which really your presentation will probably be what, 20 minutes? About 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I can, I can drag it out if we want to. I can, you know, I can stop and answer questions on the way. Um, I people may want to ask questions along the way um, and then we can have some discussion after I don't anticipate this going the full hour and a half honestly I, I don't I don't think so either I, I mean I'm, I find you know I do a fair bit of sort of online consulting to the mass timber market and I try and never go over an hour and a half because I find by about an hour and 10 minutes I'm I'm losing um, uh, I'm losing the audience. Yeah, for sure. I agree. On that, it's, it's, uh, they're told. Any idea? I mean, you do people need to pre sign up for this thing? I mean, we've, I know Peter's going to show up. I, Peter and I, yeah, so I had every, sorry, I'm just going to turn up my volume here. I had everybody pre register and, um, including you, me, and Patty, we have 20 people. So 17. Oh, okay. Yeah, so 17 people outside of us. And we have different people um, than last time, like so, some of the same, but a lot of different people than last time, which is nice. Good. So Max okay. and Theo are back. Um, Kettle River Timber Timberworks, Bob from Artisan, Pat of employees, Dwayne from West Eco, Andreas, and Mira from ILTBA. Oh, good. Yep. From ILBA. ILBA, sorry, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so uh, um, you're going to want to give them a little bit of time to get signed in. So we'll start 
we'll yeah. probably start what at five after or something like that yeah yeah and patty said she'd be a bit late but that's not a big deal yeah she's she's heard of she's heard enough of this stuff over, <laughs> over the years yeah uh, not her responsibility this time so yes and i i own i Oh, Mira, an article. So this is also going to be an article in in <coughs> in ILBA. Oh, great! Uh, newsletter. So that sort of serves. I mean, I, I'll I'll be exerting parts of it and break it into. I, I did the preliminary. I did the first part of the article, but I need to do probably a second and a third. I'm trying to. I've committed to putting an article in every newsletter, but I've just this last one. I just. I, I haven't been able to get my shit together. I had enough. Everybody's everybody's so busy. Yeah, yeah, which is good. Um, but the scary part now for everybody is what's happening to wood supply. Mm -hmm. uh, wood supply, labor supply. You know, just like I'm, this week, I've had my builders all peeling logs all week because I just don't have I don't have the peeling capacity. Oh man, um, which is. It's like mm, that's not good when you've got builders, you know, with thirty years experience. Uh, peeling logs. Peeling logs. Now, I mean, it's finish peeling on on components. Uh, you know, it's not out. It's not out doing the heavy, the heavy debarking. But yeah, that's a that's a real challenge. Um, okay, looks like we've got some people. Andreas, is that Andreas Fricken by any chance? No. Yes, it is. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, goodness, I'm, I do not want these notifications. Settings. I have, um, because I'm going to school at the same time, I have all sorts of different notifications popping up and... <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm going to try and close this too. All right. Cool. Perfect. Bob? Good afternoon. Good Hi. afternoon, Bob. How are you this I'm, time? I'm, I'm good. I'm from Abbotsford. I work for uh, Artisan Lock Homes in Mission, and I'm okay. Dutch. I'm Dutch. So. You're Dutch. I, <laughs> I Dutch. figured that was probably... Uh, oh, because of my name, yeah. Your name, yeah, Van der... Uh, so, Van der Vliet? No, Vliet. Vliet. Vliet, like, like Fleetwood Mac. Vliet. Okay, Van der Vliet. Yes. And then there's a Spurlick there trying to connect to the audio. Uh, Perfect. So it looks like he's connecting. Uh, yes, the joys of Zoom meetings, eh? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I, next week I get my vaccine. Oh, good. Uh, me too. Too. Yeah, me, me too. Me too. And yeah. I, it, it's going to be Astra. I don't mind. I don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't care which one it is. I mean, no, I, me neither. No, yeah. no. I ended up yeah. with I ended up with Pfizer, but I wouldn't have been allowed the Astra because I'm under that age cap. But yeah. okay. But it was a non-issue. Just do arm circles, and it shouldn't. It, I found I didn't have any pain. I had a headache for a few days, but that was it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm 59, so. Astra, I, I think I think it will be okay. I'm healthy. I, I sport a lot, so I do exercises. I, I'm okay. Yeah, <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. yeah, I am. I am so ready to hit the road and tour around and just be social. But it's uh... <laughs> have a life again. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I have to admit, I'm, I'm, I tend to be a bit of a social retard myself. So, you know. This this isolation really was not a mm. huge change for me, um, but a year of it, yeah, okay, that's enough. yeah, it's a long, it's a long stretch, it's too long. Okay, so Peter Andrew sitting with you, Peter. Yeah, can you guys hear us? Yep. We can. Yes. You don't hear all the chainsaws in the background. <laughs> nope, no, nope. it's pretty quiet. Pretty good filter. Hey, Kelly. So, Kelly, are the rest of them calling in from the office? Uh, yeah, I do see them, the logo there. Um, so, I think, yeah, they're setting it up. Oh, they're on me. But, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who, who's all there? Or do, do we got a couple people? Right now, it's, it's just me. So, I, I don't know for, for uh, 
design team, I'm sure going to be joining in separately because it's not a huge room here. Um, like with their, I'll talk with them right now. Yeah, but I think in the room is our production manager for manufacturing is going to join. Yeah, he's not here yet, but yeah. Okay. Okay, so yeah, I think we were going to, we were going to give, we weren't going to get started until about five or a little bit after, uh, after one, one o'clock, just to give, give people a chance to join. Yeah, we still have seven people, seven more people that we're waiting on. <clears throat> okay. All right. If people can hear me qu quite good. Yes, coming in loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 No problem at all. That's good. That's I like good. I like your background. Nice looking building. I think yeah, I like it. yeah, we're building in the States. Yeah, that's uh, our uh, our project. Yeah. And I'm working on a project in my home country, the Netherlands. It's gonna be a log home style restaurant, and it's gonna be the first in its kind. So I'm very excited about that. Cool. So are you doing uh, design work for uh, Artisan? I'm more sales and marketing. So yeah. I uh, am the middle middle guy. I, 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 I do just marketing and our sales designing. We are, we are designing house also, yeah. but also we work with streamline design in Abbotsford here. So, yes. Yeah. 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 On that. So it looks like we have Max and Dwayne. Do, do, do. Excellent. Just making sure everyone's here. And Mira. Okay. We'll give it two more minutes here, and then I okay. think that that's pretty much everyone. Can, can this, this session be recorded? You know that? or It's recording right now. It's recording. Oh, that's good because I'll, uh, you know, I'll go back and see what uh, we talked about. Um, since it's all pretty technical, I'm not such, such a technical guy. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, but your, your, uh, your outfit is, has been, um, you know, occasionally you're going to hear phone ringing in the background, but it did. <laughs> okay. Basically. Yeah, I mean the artisan team. You guys have been gasketing and doing ceiling and and whatnot. So, oh yeah, yeah. I mean it. This is this is a bit of an overview. Um, okay. You know, with, yeah. With, with the focus mainly on on handcrafted log houses, a little bit about uh, you know a variety of different methods of approaching. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Air, you know, primarily focused on air sealing the building envelope in you know timber log houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, gotcha. primarily focused on what I know, which is which is the handcrafted industry. But uh, Kelly, we mm -hmm. do we do touch on the machine industry a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, gasketing started in the machine industry. Um, Correct. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Lo long before long before the uh, the handcrafted industry. It depends how you define gasket. Some people consider yeah. Fiber <laughs> yeah. fiberglass a gasket or spangam moss a gasket and um, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't define mm -hmm. it as a gasket um, per se. But uh, what do you figure, Michelle? Shall we? Uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much everyone. So we're shall ready we, to go. Shall we rock and roll here? So. Um, so if everyone can just mute yourselves, um, except for John, of course, until um, if you have a question or whatever. But uh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to mute. Yeah. yeah. If um, you know, I've got. I've got a. 30 slides, but within those slides, some of them have four or five images in it. Um, uh, I can stretch this out um, and feel free to interrupt. I think, you know, if you've got a question right in the middle of stuff, um, you know, with a point, it's probably, I think with this smaller group, it's fine to interrupt. If we had 20, 25 people, then you probably don't want interruptions, but feel free to ask a question in the middle of, of that. So. Um, my intent is to look at, you know, our approach to, uh, to sealing, what we've experimented with over the years, a little bit what the industry is doing. Um, I sort of start off when, when a log house leaks. I don't go if a log house leaks. I go when a log house leaks because they will leak. Um, it's the log builder's fault um, for sure. Um, and 
you know, building airtight homes, I think, has got to be a key goal. Um, energy performance. Our value is is sort of meaningless if you can't get your air if you can't manage your air leakage. You know, if you're getting five air changes per hour, I don't care if you've got R40 in your walls. You've still got a house that's not performing. Um, you know, in the industry over the time that I've been in it, which I don't want, even want to admit how long that is now, um, has has evolved uh, what we're doing. You know, we've looked at a lot of historic methods. Um, you know, we've done some testing, in, in both formal and informal. Um, but if we can't solve this air leakage problem, um, we we will. Uh, we'll lose the fight to stay relevant with building codes. Um, but the challenge often is it isn't just the log work leaking. I mean, here's some blower door tests that RDH uh, did um, during the study they did for LTBI. Um, you can see there's a bit of smoke leaking from the notches. And we found typically in blower door tests of log houses, the laterals actually did fairly well. Um, uh, it was the notches that were a challenge, and we'll look at that. Um, here, we're running, a, there's a theatrical fog machine running while the house was pressurized. Um, um, but leakages in other assemblies were often as, as much of an issue. I mean, here's a quite a decent quality window actually leaking. Um, so maybe it wasn't as good a quality window as we thought. Uh, I, this to me is a great image because there's so many of us that have done this. You know, we put up our rafters or purlins and then put two by uh, two by six TNG decking over the the thing, insulation on top of that, and way we went, and then wondered why the house was hard to heat. Um, here, this is a combination of a blower door running um, and thermal imaging camera and uh, the theatrical fog machine all running at the same time. This is on a timber frame house. Very good contractor. You know, I know the contractor on the building. I know the builder, um, but they just missed one little point and every single tongue and groove is leaking on this building. And, and they struggled making four air changes per hour on, on this building. And that was very difficult to fix. Um, so critical uh, interfaces are foundations to bottom rounds. There's leakage there, round doors and windows, um, post to uh, um, to log panels for piece on piece, roof framing and finishing. Those those were the areas we we actually saw more problems with. Uh, so that's this is a couple of no nos. You can see there's leakage around the purlin. The purlin has done a little bit of shrinking, um, and it wasn't it wasn't properly sealed. Um, so the building code in recent years has gone from focusing on fire and safety to energy, and it's biting the industry hard. We're really struggling to deal with it. Um, the focus today is let's solve this air leakage problem. That's really the first, and it's the low-hanging fruit. It's not that difficult to do. Um, RDH uh, helped us with uh, with testing log walls, both gasketed and not gasketed, different types of gasketing, um, several different approaches. And that was very valuable exercise for our association, I think was time and money well spent. Um, so, you know, they were able to establish some basic performance uh, values for walls. And, and, you know, we had some spectacular failures where, you know, they, the, the wall assembly leaked and we had some spectacular successes. Um, I will say the successes were gasketed and the failures were, well, we won't talk about the failures. Um, there's a couple of, there's, there's a machined wall, actually that, that was Brian Moore's dovetail wall, um, and then a, a handcrafted wall. One of the critical things when we built our sample for this, I made sure that the crew picked dried logs fully checked. But I also made sure they did not use severe spiral because a severe spiral grain will have a check that actually transit right through the building envelope. Um, so that's one of the other reasons not to use spiral logs. Um, so the formal testing was important and, and it's, you know, it's demonstrating that we can do this, that we can meet the requirements because blower door tests are coming to a, uh, 
house site near you. They're going to be mandatory in the province within a few years. Um, but uh, yeah, understanding how to install gasket and what you need to do when you're cutting the logs is important. Um, the ILBA, the International Log Building Association, for years had to document the uh, log building standards, which was a minimum uh, standard. In 2010, we actually abandoned the log building standards and adopted what we call the effective practices and methods document. Um, I think it's actually one of the more important documents in handcrafted log building right now. And then every builder should have a copy and actually every owner should have a copy of it. Um, and the effective practices allowed us to promote best practice rather than minimum practice. A, a log building standard is about minimum practice effective, we could, uh, that's so one of the key changes was encouraging gasketing. Um, there's, there's the one commentary in that I'm not going to read that, but, um, you know, it's a standard on the left, two point D point two long grooves should have an effective barrier to water, air, water vapor, and should be continuous gaskets or seals. Um, uh, gaskets should be placed, uh, inside the groove, um, and both inside and outside is, is recommended. Fiberglass, rock wool, sheep's wool, and other space filling materials have been shown to be not sufficiently effective uh, as a barrier to liquid water, water vapor, or air. Um, space filling in, in insulation is not by itself an effective gasket. Furthermore, some space filling materials are hygroscopic. They attract and will hold water. Um, now, they eventually dry out if you have sufficient roof overhangs, but we found if, if a building's put together with really wet material that you'll actually, especially if it's a green log, you'll get uh, mold and mildew starting very quickly. And, and I've had that happen in my own houses. Uh, we'll look at that. Bit of history of gasketing. John? Yes. Hey, it's Mira. Mira. Um, Hi, Mira. I, Hi. I think it's important to point out that the log building standard or the best practices document was updated in 2020. It was, and, yes. And it's available through the ILBA. Yes, it's available on their website um, for, uh, for download. I think it's uh, 25 bucks and it's $25 really well spent. Um, I think it's an excellent document. So uh, machine cut industry has been gasketing for over 65 years. And in fact, Kelly, you probably could tell me, seeing as your company was one of the very first companies using gaskets and and i think it's been i think it's been around 65 years or even longer um and seal tape is is one that a lot of us are familiar with that was a product uh a company in ontario um that was particularly effective um i've been using the m seal for gasketing since 1984 i think so it's been around a long time, but this is where it started. It started in the machine cut industry. And it was designed to be used under um, very tightly controlled conditions where the tolerance between the, the, you know, the wood fit was measured in a couple of millimeters and the gasket would be 75 to 80% compressed. Um, and it's basically an open cell foam impreg impregnated with a bitumen or acrylic resin. Um, it's then compressed and shipped in reels. I won't go into, I won't read that out, but that's, that's from the MSEALS uh, website. Um, very effective product. But the challenge was about 40 years ago, handcrafters started to look at gasketing and MSEAL was one of the early products we used. Um, and they started marketing to the log home builders, uh, handcrafted and machine cut. Um, that's a, actually a double scribe lateral groove from uh, Lloyd Beckett Earth Yard, and you can see the gasket in there. Um, the challenge was, there were several challenges. Um, the, the gasket is actually a fairly small gasket. It's fully expanded about three quarters of an inch. Um, and when we're cutting by hand, you know, that three quarter inch gasket should actually be in a quarter to three eighths inch, inch gap. And I just can't keep my tolerances when I'm cutting by hand. In the machine cut, yeah, no problem. So we were we were finding that the gasket was usually fully expanded when it was in in the, and when it's fully expanded, 
air and water will pass through it. In fact, it becomes a sponge. Um, and the other challenge was um, it was attached with an adhesive, um, which worked when you had a really clean, smooth surface. But when it was on a, on a surface covered with sawdust and chain oil, it didn't stick. So you were stapling it. And every time you put a staple in, you created um, you created a little leak or the potential for a little leak on that. So it, it wasn't the ideal material. Um, you know, I used it for, and I still use it in some places, but we went looking for other materials and better materials. I mean, there actually were putting it together and we always had to put it together while we were in assembling the building because it expanded and it was quite fragile. So we couldn't pre-install it in the yard. So we had to spread all the logs out across the building and do the gasketing on site. And that was sometimes a challenge on tight sites. Uh, this is a job that's Ingrid in the middle there with a roll of gasket covering her face. That was about 20 years ago or 25 years ago down in North Carolina. Um, but it rained the whole time we were doing it. The fiberglass got wet, the gasket got wet. It kept wanting to fall out. So it was a challenge. Um, and it's, best used where you where you can control the gap size like I still use it in dovetail uh, sometimes uh, or between post and beam though even there I've substituted um, standard backer rod was one we tried but the standard backer rod was was too stiff so we found a backer rod called soft seal which had a open cell core and a closed cell skin and that was actually a big improvement um, but again, you can see in this picture, I've got staples across the gasket, which means I've got air leaks everywhere I put it, or the potential for air leak everywhere I put it. So um, that still wasn't that still wasn't ideal. Uh, we did find pretty quickly that we could actually pre-install it in our yard, and so we stopped doing this, which is spread the logs all over the place and gasket it on site. I've experimented with a few others. Um, EDPM is a synthetic rubber. Um, um, the the P shape it comes from conservation technology and that one inspired, that's what inspired me. Uh, I tried it, there was stuff I didn't like about it. Um, they were very expensive and they didn't have quite enough compression resistance or a large enough section. The bottom gasket is the one developed by Robert Chambers. Um, which is a custom, I, I think, very effective gasket. I've tried to talk him into selling it to me or letting me sell it, but uh, uh, he, I, he wasn't really, he liked the fact that he had an exclusive product that worked well. It's, it's got a, you can see there's three little fins. Um, can you see my mouse when it's on the screen? Yes. Yeah. So you can see he's got a fairly stiff backer and then three progressively softer pieces of Santa Prine. Um, each one creates a, a capillary break. Um, so that was, that was quite a good one. I've also tried using spray foam. Um, there's a product called uh, Enerfoam, which stays a little bit soft. And we put a whole building together where we actually just put spray foam uh, on the saddle and landed the log on the spray foam and, and did the same in the lateral grooves. Um, I, it was that was messy. Um, I think it was pretty effective, but we did it with a spruce building, green logs, and the spruce moved quite a bit as it dried, and, and so it tore. And where that where that foam was the, the 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 torn surface was exposed, we found that actually it would absorb and hold water. Um, so it was too brittle to move with the logs. So it wasn't it wasn't effective. It was worth a try. Um, I think it did, you know, it had some advantages, but caulking, exterior caulking, um, you know, that's, that's a possibility. And there are a lot of, a lot of builders that, that go, well, I don't need an internal gasket because you're going to energy seal the building anyways. Um, but it does hide the scribe craft and it needs to be installed after the building is fully settled. So that may be three or four years later. So you really don't have a guarantee that it's going to get done. And it's not going to help you pass a blower door test because a blower door test ha needs to happen before occupancy. So um, some of them also don't do very well with, with uh, UV. Key with any kind of sealant is proper installation of a sealant. And here's a picture with a backer rod. 
and fully expanded. If you don't have the backer rod in there, that when the log moves, that will uh, tear because the uh, the sealant is fully adhered to the whole surface. So the stretch zone ends up being really only about a sixteenth of an inch. So backer rod is really critical to that. Um, you know, another effective alternative is is uh, to scribe fit is actually chinked buildings. You know, I'm I'm uh, uh, I sort of call myself a closet chinker um, uh, on that, and and that I actually I like the look of chinked buildings. I mean, almost all our dovetail are chinked. The perma chink product. There's other products out there, whether uh, Weatherall and and Sashko and Sanson all make chinking products um, that are pretty effective and stand up well. Uh, the middle picture is is what I'm using currently. We sort of took the best of a bunch of different products and and uh, um, created a P. So the the small leg of the P is is intended to do two things. It's intended to give me a place to put staples, and it's also intended to make the gasket quite a bit wider so that it helps seal checks that run into it. Um, yeah, the bottom picture you can see in the notch. I've actually put the gasket around the perimeter. Um, I've got a bag in, in the middle that's full of uh, space uh, insulation like uh, sheep's wool or rock wool. The lateral groove, you can see there's little short pieces across the lateral groove. So on either side of any electrical drilling or through bolt drilling or behind keyways, there's a short little piece uh, that goes in there. Um, critical thing is it needs to hang the log up when you put your a fully gasketed log on the building the first time the gasket should hang the log up which is a pain in the ass and the first time you know log builders use gasket and they're often on the phone to me going i hate this stuff but i try and keep them on the phone for about five minutes and after five minutes it will have settled down we're often throwing ratchet straps over the log ends to pull that log down but if it's not hanging up, then I don't have sufficient compressive force. Um, this is actually a picture from my own house, which uh, I've been in 20 some years now and is still not finished. Um, and I use caulking here between uh, the SIP panel and the, uh, um, and the log and the caulking after about 10 years was almost all failed. It, 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 it embrittled. Um, fortunately, I had a, belt and suspenders approach. I've got M I had M-seal gasket in behind and the M-seal gasket was still doing the job pretty effectively. It's a little over expanded because it was a fairly small strip of M-seal, but um, caulking by itself, I'm not a big fan of. Uh, I, I prefer gaskets. Gaskets have a better long-term performance. Um, this is what we're doing currently in infill framing applications, log post and beam, um, on gable ends where there's a post supporting a ridge with framing against it. The, the first stud is spaced off the log with a, um, uh, a piece of door skin. Um, and then there's a gasket installed either side and then the plywood goes over that gasket. Um, it then gets insulated. And then in the, in the belt and suspenders approach, we're then using uh, a SEGA type tape uh, on this. This is a uh, picture from a post and beam that we did the year before last in Whistler. You can, there's a bunch of stuff happening here. A, the studs have been foamed, um, which is a very effective air seal within the stud space. You can see the, um, uh, the, the cripple and jack on either side of the window has been fully taped or caulked. So the joint between the studs, that's a big point of leakage. Those leak like crazy. Um, on that, especially if you're, you know, in a bit of a dry area, because you'll get sh some shrinkage there. So those are completely taped. It's a lot of extra work. This bit of tape right here comes onto the onto the log. This the uh, um, there's a variety of different tapes out there. The Sega tape, though, um, is just it's amazing stuff. My Swiss guy introduced it to me years ago, and he stuck a piece of it on a hot tub to repair a leak and. 10 years later, it's still holding that leak. He hasn't repaired it. So that was pretty extreme. Um, this, this would be something you would use in any kind of construction, not just log post and beam, you know, uh, timber frame. Um, 
I didn't go, I was going to look at some of the commercial work we've done and some of the membranes and CLT and glue lamb, but I just, I felt we didn't, weren't going to have time uh, within the scope of what we're doing here. Again, getting back to testing RDH, you know, we learned a ton by doing testing and we actually test a lot. Um, um, I mean, for instance, here I'm, I'm testing water absorption of, uh, that I'm completely submerging a piece of soft seal because it's got an open cell foam and then I weigh it again and you can see how much water it absorbed. Went from four grams to 59 grams. So, um, but then I tested the same piece of, uh, same piece of gasket without submerging the cut ends, just submerging the side of it and it didn't get it, gain any weight at all. We, you know, we did a one hour, sub, uh, one hour submersion with, uh, um, uh, and yeah, you don't want to, you don't want to let your, whatever material you're using, you do not want to let it get saturated with water, whether it's fiberglass, rock wool, sheep's wool, uh, foam or gasket is not a good idea because uh, it, it'll create problems inside the lateral groove and sometimes very quickly. Um, that's a really faded, really low res picture, but that shows how we're cutting the lateral groove. Um, it's a four or five cut lateral groove. Um, this is actually one of our Russian customers using gasket over in Russia. And I'm actually selling more of this P gasket in Europe than I am in all, all of North America. Um, this is overkill. He cuts, all his laterals are cut like this. Um, he's got beautiful wood that he's working with. But, um, you know, we've tested it, compressing this this much and leaving it for months and then re releasing the compression and it rebounded 95%, uh, which is good. I, do, I, I feel 50% compression is sufficient. That's a lot of extra effort to do that. But the good thing, he's got a kerf on the top of the log, very shallow cut on the bottom. So he's unlikely to get checking uh, in the bottom of the log. He's more likely to get checking in the top of the log, which is going to help the fit and reduce the amount of overall settling. Um, hang on one second. Gas, so this picture shows the problem with gasketing uh, in the notch. You can see the fairly heavy checks here at the bottom. You know, there's a heavy check right here, for instance. If I didn't have this large gasket, um, this check would do an end run around my gasket, would allow air to leak into here. And then there's another check over here, and this may be the interior side and bang, I got an air leak right through the notch. We've seen that in blower door tests. Um, we did have our gasket um, company make pillows for us that filled the whole notch, but we needed about eight different sizes. Um, and if we had a cut edge along the edge of it, if we cut it to make it smaller, then it would absorb water through the edge. Plus they wanted about eight bucks per pillow. And I just, I didn't, I wasn't willing to pay that. I didn't think my customers were will, willing to pay that. So we're using a, basically this is an industrial 22, uh, 22 liter um, kitchen garbage bag, like a, you know, a kitchen catcher from Glad. Um, there are a couple of cents a piece and it's filled with insulation. The one caution, if you're, if you're putting this in green wood, you'll actually trap water under this and you'll get mildew growth under it. So um, if I'm using green wood and, and thing, I will actually put a coat of, you know, Sansom KP12 or zinc naphthenate or something to, to inhibit mold growth under this, uh, under this pillow and under the gasket. Um, and that, that, that can be an issue. It, it doesn't turn into, you know, it will dry out eventually, but uh, if I can prevent mildew from growing on, on a log, it's a good thing. Um, I rarely use fiber insulation in the lateral groove unless the lateral groove is getting wider than about 120 millimeters, because I find the P gasket completely fills it. Uh, the P gasket's got an R value of about 4.4, which is higher than wood. So it actually helps boost the performance in the lateral groove. Um, this is actually just a page off of uh, Robert Chambers' uh, website. He's got actually a great website uh, um, worth, worth going and try a couple of good websites. He's got lots of good information on there on his uh, logbuilding.org. Um, 
This is a recent picture that Peter uh, sent me here just a couple of days ago. He's experimenting using a, a pad of, of foam to completely fill the space. There's a detail of it. He, he, uh, the building he's doing this in has really big roof overhangs. He's promised he's not going to put it together in the pouring rain. Um, and he's going to get an awesome blower door test with this. Um, uh, there's going to be no leakage in the notches. I, I, I would be concerned with water absorption. I would not want to put this together in the rain because that is an open cell foam. Um, but it's got good R value. Um, flies aren't going to live in it the way they will in fiberglass. Um, and it's, it's going to air seal that building. I mean, that's, I think that's going to do a great job um, on that. Just the key proviso being keep it dry. Um, this is, oh, there's Gasket Girl. Um, she's, uh, she's teaching one of the log builders how to log build. Um, and you can see in the bottom photo. So he's doing a four and or five cut lateral groove. Uh, two very shallow cuts fo following right along the, uh, um, the scribe line. Then a little bit deeper wasting cut. I usually don't like it to meet in a V here. I like it to uh, uh, be fairly shallow. We try and avoid stress focuses in the lateral groove as much as possible and then we'll curve the top of the log and here there's a simple draw knife there's a draw knife i built with an inch and a quarter piece of planer blade that sort of drops the blade below so you can do it um, this guy up here is just a car spring sharpened with a chunk of pipe welded to it um, here i've modified a makita groover with a, just a little um, foot that fits in the chainsaw groove and we'll plow that very precisely um, this was actually one of my owner builder customers down at Dan Sadler down in California sent me this picture and um, he just modified a router so he could get a really nice clean um, seat that was a consistent depth. So it's not that difficult to cut, but it, gasketing is extra work. Um, this is how I'm, the tool I'm using to uh, cut the gasket seat right now, probably a little extreme for most builders, but uh, we're having fun with that for sure. Uh, gasketing dovetail notches. So I like a double gasket. Uh, anywhere I can, I like to have two or three gaskets. And this is actually a continuous gasket that goes all the way up the wall. Um, and uh, that was actually the, the, the initial illustration, uh, Nick Barrowin, who is my uh, dealer in Europe for, uh, for gasket. Uh, some of you will, will know Nick. He's a German builder, just awesome builder. Um, and uh, I added the green line for a second gasket. Um, that's again, we saw that picture before that, but that's in a dovetail. Um, this is gasketing uh, between a piece on piece. This is, this is actually everything you see here is robot cut uh, piece on piece panel. So we have a triple gasket here. There's a little seat machined. You can see the seat right here is machined for a seven eighths gasket and it'll be 80% compressed. Then the back has a uh, 10 mil gap for a um, uh, 40 mil gasket. Um, and then we have a gasket over the top so that the uh, plate beam and there's a spline tenon and a barrel bolt that pulls the whole thing together. There's, there's that, whoops, sorry, that's pulled tight. So you can see with the robot, we're able to get tolerances that I just can't do by hand. So actually gasketing is proving to be pretty easy. We were getting some pretty good results with that. Um, I put this picture in because this is not how you want to cut your lateral grooves. You know, and unfortunately, this is, this used to be all too common. I don't think it's very common anymore. But this was actually a picture from a large commercial builder at one point. They were occasionally buying gasket and putting gasket in here. But I, I was reluctant to sell it because I just felt it's a waste of time. Um, this is another builder who's using the gasket, but he doesn't want to do the handwork. He, so he's using, uh, he's using a chainsaw to you know, come across and sort of waste that wood out. And as a result, I, he's not getting an optimum result. You know, over here, pretty good. Over here, eh, just not doing the job. Um, getting that compression is, is really critical, um, you know, and it's, it, it does take a little bit of extra work. It takes some training of your people. It takes some good quality control. 
And that's it. Gasket Girl modeling some of the gasket products, other uses for gasket. And uh, boy, I zipped through that pretty quickly. Okay. Do we have any questions? I can see Peter Reed. Hello, guys. This is Max. Hey, Max. Hey. Hey, um, yeah, good presentation. Um, yeah, I know that uh, you don't like the, the caulking, but, but we find that stuff works uh, really great. And it lasts, I don't know, a lot of the buildings we've used um, last 25 plus years yep. um, on the structure, and uh, we have no issues. And uh, yeah, just like to let people know that stuff works really well. You know, Sasco brand, um, uh, they have um, they have Conceal, and there's that Permachink brand um, called yeah, Energy yeah, Seal. Yeah, the Energy Seal, and and yeah. and I have actually found that the Permachink brands mm -hmm. and and the ones specifically designed for sealing log houses, the chinking especially, have worked have worked really well. What mm -hmm. I've found hasn't worked is is a small bead of caulking on a green building um mm -hmm. and then because it just there wasn't a, there wasn't sufficient stretch for it to uh, um, yeah. uh for it to seal especially if there wasn't a backer rod a bond uh, you know a bond breaker mm -hmm. between it so mm -hmm. the downside i found with caulking was it needed to be done after the building was dried in and yeah, which, yeah which, that's the best way of doing it for sure yeah, yeah. after building is dry that way all the checks can be filled if needed and uh yeah all that stuff um, but yeah with the new new uh door blower tests in the states and stuff like that uh pretty much they have to do that right away um before they get the testing done so yeah and then because uh, we have I, I mean i have to admit um i'm restaining my house uh, this year it's been 20 years since i've stained it and I'm going to be using energy seal in some places. You know, I've got some places where stuff moved and the gasket I've got behind was, was, um, you know, already too expanded. So I'm concerned that, so I am actually going to be using energy seal there, but the building is mm -hmm. after 20 years is pretty stable. Um, yep. and, uh, so it, it's a, it's a challenge of timing, um, uh, yep. on that. And, and because, doing, uh, you know, applying energy seal or, or uh, any of the similar products on a green building immediately after construction is, I, I think is problematic because uh, you are going to get, uh, you're going to get a lot of failure unless you're doing a chink joint, you know, which is a really wide with a backer rod behind it. And, and so. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's definitely recommended a little, little thicker caulking a joint for sure. And, uh, yeah, usually after um, after a couple of years of the initial caulking, they usually have to go back anyways and just any checks that formed during the drying process, they should go and fill those too with backer rod and small bead of caulking and all that stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'm filling, uh, you know, I've, I've done that as well. And I think you've got to be really careful about filling checks because uh, I've seen in some of the restoration work we've done where checks were filled and actually it ended up trapping water behind it and didn't allow it to dry out. So filling all the checks. Yeah. 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 It's not, definitely challenges. Yeah, it's challenges it's, and everything. It's not something sure. I would recommend, um, <laughs> but going in and filling a check, you know, if you, if you've identified a water leak that's coming, you know, through, um, through water hitting a check, um, yeah. then, you know, then that might be an idea, but quite often what will happen is the check will expand or extend itself a little bit. It will have a little bit of an open end, water will get in. And now because there's, there's a sealant there, it can't get out again uh, easily. And, and uh, um, yeah, we did a restoration for the Lower Nickel Indian Band on their arbor and, and they had gone in and sealed um, and, and done exactly that. And, and actually that had, they would have been better off if they hadn't done that. Um, yeah. Now that was logs pretty exposed to the weather, um, and mm -hmm. I mean, often really the best solution to so many of the problems with log houses. You know, I'm, I've been testing uh, stains. Actually, let me just get out of here. I've been testing stains for thirty, thirty some years now. Um, let me just go and see if I can find. And and a lot of builders are asking me, you know, what's what's the best stain and finish out there and my response you know and because i've been looking for the magic bullet the you know the stain i can put on 
you know, one or two coats, relatively inexpensive. Uh, um, so there's, <laughs> yeah, there's, it's pretty hard to find. <laughs> here's some of our testing. It just, it just, oh, well. you know, and we've been doing this since 1992. About every four years, we'll do 40 or 50, 40 or 50 new products. Um, and the best stain is a big roof overhang. Um, it just it certainly just, helps, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. Uh, it makes such a difference. Uh, um, but uh, <laughs> what was that, Peter? Did you have a call? Oh, uh, no, I was just reading your results there. So. <laughs> oh. oh. okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't. I mean, I've. You know, I mean, there. Yeah, it's it's interesting to look at the results from you know, almost 30 years ago, 92, when, when, you know, the, the, uh, um, uh, the, pro you know, the products that were doing best, like the Sickens, um, you know, was outperforming everything, but it was causing problems on a log house because it would not allow it to breathe. And if you had multiple coats of Sickens on it, you would trap too much water under there. But from a straight point of view of durability, nothing touched it. Um, but with the changing VOC regulations, they, you know, they reformulated it at one point as a water-based finish and it went, it went from one of the best performers to probably the worst. A couple of key things on stain, you know, cause stain is often an important part of protecting the building and keeping it intact was, um, uh, surface texture made a significant difference and the amount of pigment, um, you know, there's a lot of stains out there now that, that if you go back here, that, that have very little pigment or translucent natural oxides. And, and in my stain tests, most of those, most of those were failed in, um, yeah, they were failed in about 11 months ex exposure. You know, you can see the, all of these light guys I consider these, this here, that was failed. Uh, that's failed. That's those two had failed, that had failed. And by failing, I, I judge failing when it starts to lose water repellency or when you're, when you're seeing visible graying on the wood surface um, on that. That to, that, that to me was, was a failure um, on that. But uh, yeah, so stain testing. Yeah, it's, you know, there's good stains out there, but I, I still haven't found the magic bullet. Um, I'll let you know. I'll give up what I'm doing here and start selling stain if I find uh, the magic bullet. But I, with I don't think it's possible um, with just how powerful ultraviolet uh, um, ultraviolet radiation is. I, you know, I don't think people realize. I got a picture here that illustrates that. That's on my own house. Yeah, that's the air. The air temperature was 97. This is Fahrenheit for for you uh, younger people who only know Celsius. Um, in the shade, um, the log end matched the air temperature within a half degree. There's the temperature on the log facing the sun out on the west side of the building. It's 178 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's almost double the air temperature. And that's why the top logs, you know, they literally get burned right off. When you get that kind of energy hitting any kind of surface, it gets the molecules very excited and they just start blowing right off the surface of the wood. Um, and uh, people don't realize just how hot your log gets. Um, you realize that on your car, if you went and put your hand on the, on the hood of your truck uh, on that day, it would burn you. You can't keep your hand there, but you can put your hand on the log because it doesn't give up energy. It's a pretty good insulator, but it's a warm enough temperature that, that, uh, uh, it really affects that. You should never apply a stain in this kind of temperature. The stain just will flash right off. It will not bond to the wood and it'll fail within months if you applied stain in that kind of temperature. So those two pictures are... All right, boy, we, could, we zip through that pretty quickly, 45 minutes. Anything else? I've got uh, a sample of that uh, foam that Mm -hmm. We had made up here for uh, post and beam connections. So you have that uh, picture that you had up just before you went to the stains. Uh, yep. Let me just uh, the the which picture the picture of your gasket. No, a picture of that top of your post with it looked like a forty five degree angle brace right, coming right. into the top of it. Right, right, right. Let me see where that picture is. That would be. 
Um, I have way too many pictures, testing, taping. Um, um, hang on. Let me go. I, I think I've got that in Abby, the robot uh, pep gasketing. You're talking about this guy? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's the kind of scenario where you've got a, a post going on top of that, or pardon me, a beam going on top of that post, plus you have the, uh, the brace coming in from the side. So you've got all these different areas that you're trying to keep the air from filtering through. Yeah. And uh, I really think that these are the answer to a lot of our problems because we're dealing with checks, we're dealing with joinery, uh, sometimes we're dealing with penetration, so you get a fastener in there too, and uh, just a sheet of this foam, which has uh, an adhesive on it as well. It just peels off. Oh, cool. Stuck on there um, will, I think, give us 95% efficiency in situations like that with a you know, $3 or $4 chunk of foam. I don't think, it, I don't think it's even that much, actually. Um, it's like pretty, how pretty how are you compress? Are you just relying on the weight of the plate log to compress that, or are you pulling it down with a screw or a bolt? Or well, we typically do have a bolt in our connections. Yeah. Um, this is a quarter inch thick. This this piece here. Yep. Um, but uh, you can get these in whatever thickness you want. Hmm. So I'm I'm pretty excited about it. I know you know yeah. if you. If you're looking at situations where there could be moisture infiltration, that uh, is obviously something you have to take into consideration. Uh, we did we didn't do an actual submersion test, but it does seem to have a considerable amount of water repellency as far as just droplets go. Um, if you you know forcefully put it in a in a and, and bend it or you know um, manipulate it, then of course it. It wants it acts like a sponge, but uh, I think given, you know, that we have to be aware of those properties and we want to build a, a building that is not, uh, is not getting any rain exposure anyways. I mean, you know, proper log house shouldn't be getting regular moisture. I don't think it's an insurmountable problem, but then again, there might be manufacturers that, you know, have a similar product that is, I think you mentioned, you may may have run into one that has manufactured a foam like that's waterproof. It might be as simple as finding the right coating. Um, but I think it's the answer to a lot of our, our issues as far as moisture infiltration. Even when you're talking uh, the lateral groove on a, on a log house, uh, obviously the notch is a big problem, but even the lateral groove uh, where you have penetrations, you've got uh, electrical, you've got through bolts, um, you basically, sealing all that area off by filling the entire void with foam. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and the foam probably has a pretty good R value, you know, certainly my guess is the, the foam that you're holding in your hand there has an R value of about four uh, per inch. I mean, that's pretty common for that type of foam. So, so it actually boosts the performance of the weak point in the wall, um, which is, which is the lateral groove. Um, I, you know, I'm not sure if you could, factor that into an energy calculation to boost that number a little bit. Um, um, but I guess, but we, yeah, we could talk to the scientists that, uh, that conducted it. We, we did actually use your gasket, uh, the P gasket for the tests that, that were done in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, that, Cause at the time I was still kind of conceptualizing this, this idea and didn't really have a product in mind yet. You know, now in hindsight, it's like, well, I wish I had, so we actually had a physical test, but uh, we are hoping to do some more just hot plate testing with different species and you know, possibly um, part of that calculation might be if we can provide, you know, if we can get an, an R value for this from the manufacturer that they can, you know, the scientists can, can enter that into the equation and, and give us a value for that. Yeah, yeah, because that, you know, if we could boost that, wall section reduction, the 0.7 wall section reduction, you know, uh, effect uh, to lateral groove, if we could, you know, turn that to a 0.8 wall section reduction, every little bit makes a difference um, in meeting, you know, in meeting code, um, you know, as step code is adopted, we're going to have a harder and harder time um, um, in meeting codes. And, and that threatens our industry pretty dramatically right now. So Every little bit we can do um, 
is critical. But again, I feel solving solving the air leakage problem. Everything else is moot unless we can unless we can For solve sure. that. Um, yeah, I mean, we we have to we have to step up as an industry and still um, improve our standards of of what we do. And air infiltration is is the easy one. That's the the obvious one that we can improve on. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty critical, um, and uh, yeah, okay. I have a question about the foam. Um, what what is the product called, and what is it made from? The sheet foam. Um, it's a it's a an open cell, and I'm not sure actually the product name. But he called it um, poly poly something. Um, it was just sort of the we went through the products that he had available and uh, this one kind of met the owner's criteria of uh, cost and our criteria of, of how much it would rebound. It's very, very pliable. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, so when we tested it, it, uh, it bounced back. Like we had a log that uh, sat for about two weeks on the wall that had noticeable compression. And before we actually even got it, laid down on the ground most of the compression had come back out of it so it has i think most of the properties that we're looking for obviously waterproofness would be something that we maybe could improve on too but um, uh, but i think it's a pretty common it's basically i think the same thing that mcl was using essentially I, i'm not sure who the actual manufacturers are this is just from a, a local dealer who buys this stuff and cuts it into templates and strips and whatever people want and he, he does that with all different types of foam so i think similar products are are going to be available around the world but uh, i i can't tell you the actual i don't have it here in front of me the actual product name is poly something poly olefin might be there's several different polys uh, different forms uh, that are that it's doing there um yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd actually be really interested in, in talking with them and, and doing a little bit of testing on that. Um, you know, I'm wondering whether it might be possible to seal those the edges, use some sort of a um, sealant on the edges of that, because that's really what's going to be the most vulnerable. But, but as a pad between post and beam, that's, that's I think, going to be more effective than what I'm doing. And, and uh, you know, especially if you can standardize on a few different shapes. Um, Pretty effective. So that piece you're holding up was what costing you about four bucks. I have to confess, I don't know precisely, but it was, yeah, it was it wasn't even that much. I think it was, I think it was actually cheaper than wow. four bucks or three something. That's because because the pillow that we looked at, which which was a pillow of the soft seal, so it it had the waterproof skin. They were going to be about seven eight bucks per pillow. Um, now the advantage was they were waterproof but they weren't waterproof if I cut the edge to fit a smaller size notch and, and, uh, and seven, eight bucks per notch. I, I wasn't willing to pay for that. I didn't think my customers were and either log home customers or, so we didn't, we didn't pursue it. We stayed with the, with the six cent bag and 20 cents worth of, of, uh, of uh, fiber insulation in there. But, uh, well, the other cool thing about this product, I don't know if you can see that, but uh, when I peel that off, it actually has a, this, this membrane that the adhesive is on. It's very, very sticky, but it's actually a full membrane too. So when you stick that on something, it's, it's basically uh, a, a sealed membrane. So that would be water. I wonder if you could get that with the adhesive on both sides. Um, then, that, then that just leaves you with the edge to deal with. That might be uh... just make sure you place your log rate the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, otherwise you glue it down permanently. It's really sticky stuff. Cool. Well, I mean, I really like to see builders experimenting with with other gasketing and systems. So um, uh, we've we've experimented with a bunch. Um, um, you know, the the P gasket is sort of a uh, a good mix of you know price performance and whatnot, but but I think there's I think there's better ways to do it for sure. Um, on that, cool. Well, and Any... this is no, no shape or form a way to undermine what what your contribution in the products that you have brought and promoted in the industry, John. By any stretch of the imagination, I just wanted to. 
Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm always looking for a better way to do it. If, if somebody well, comes up with a well, I, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you carry this stuff and sell it to other builders, I think that's exactly where we want to be. We want to make sure that the best products are available so that uh, we're, we're doing the best job we can and have the best numbers on our, on our houses and that are testing you know, like our air blower tests are improving. That's what we need to do as an, as an entire industry. Yeah, because every time a house performs poorly, it, it, it reinforces, you know, a negative connotation about, about our industry, you know, which is log houses leak. That, you know, that, that's a statement that very few building inspectors or whatnot would dispute. And yet I would, I would argue that, well, no, they don't need, they don't need to. And I, and it really isn't that difficult to, to air seal a house. It, uh, there, there is, you know what I should show you. There's an interesting product coming out that I was going to show. And I've got a little video on it of, um, it's a patented process where you hook up a blower door test, you pressurize the whole house. And then you set up these sprayer nozzles in the, in the various rooms and they, they atomize as sealant that, that floats in the air. And, and this sealant gets pushed to every leak in the house, doesn't have, matter how small it is, and <coughs> seals it. Um, uh, you know, it takes a little while to do. It's, it's quite an interesting process. It's been designed for frame houses, but I've seen, I've seen an example where a house was blowing uh, five, six air changes per hour and with this process running for about six hours inside the house, it cost them about 4,000 US to do. They got down to half an air change per hour, um, which is a really tough to do. Um, I don't know how it would work with a log house because you sort of end up with these uh, little, little blobs of caulking and it does settle on horizontal surfaces. So you need to mask horizontal surfaces. And you don't want to walk into the house while you're doing that because you'll caulk your lungs doing it. Um, so it's a little, a little bit dangerous, but it's, it's a really interesting uh, process. Um, cool. Okay. I think, I think we're done. Any other questions or comments or? No. Are you still there, Kelly? No. I think we lost Kelly. Okay. <laughs> oh, oh no, she's there. And Mira, I do owe you an article. Yes. I know, and and, and actually, um, I'll be extracting. Uh, I mean, some of the article is in this presentation, but uh, there's there's the second half of it is is uh, will get turned into an article. I've just been stretched a little bit thin. Yeah. Well, you have until June fifteenth for a dead, uh, an initial deadline, John. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, uh, that, you know what, that I can make. All right. <laughs> cool, thanks guys. I gotta run. Thanks, okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thanks, John, that was great. Thank yeah, you. very informative. Yeah. And we'll be sending everything out, um, hopefully next week, a little summary, hopefully John's PowerPoint, and then our next okay. seminar is Rotoblast. And that's at the end of May. Cool. Look okay. forward to that one. <laughs> yeah, thank sure. you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Don't forget to complete the evaluations. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Patty. Bye. <laughs>